prehistoric life, the incredible collection of living things that appeared on Earth long before we did. Some came and went. Others came and stayed. We may call it prehistory, but to the things that lived it, it wasn't pre-anything. It was their story, and in many ways, it's ours too. Prehistory is the story that began long before any human hand made marks on a page. The earliest storytellers imagined a time when there was no life at all. Chinese myth tells of chaos shaped like an egg and split apart by two energies that battled inside it. Australian Aborigines envisioned a bare plain in a time when their eternal ancestors slept. Many scientists now believe that from an explosion called the Big Bang came a universe of swirling debris, including the molten glob that became our globe, Earth. Across millions of years, a kind of soup began to float on the surface of murky seas. But when? How can we tell the time passing in a world unseen by any living thing? An early estimate was by a 17th century scholar, Archbishop Usher. By adding up the ages of people named in the Bible, he calculated that the earth was created in 4004 BC. Meanwhile, at Cambridge University, John Lightfoot aimed for pinpoint accuracy. He agreed the year and added a date, Sunday, October the 26th, and a time, exactly 9 a.m. In the 18th century, the first geologist cast doubt on such a tender age. Clues embedded in Earth's rocky layers pointed to a much older planet. Before another century passed, Charles Darwin, the great naturalist, was to argue that Earth's age should be calculated not in thousands, but in millions of years. We now count the age of our venerable planet in billions, four and a half billion years. How can we, with such a fleeting lifespan, grapple with such numbers? If you take something old, like the entire recorded history of the known world and multiply by a thousand. Now multiply again by a thousand. Then add half a billion more. That's something closer to Earth's true age. And at first, things didn't exactly happen fast. The lifeless soup drifted for about a billion years. 365 billion sunrises before there was a single cell around to take advantage of sunlight. But then complex chemicals took form, perhaps mixing with chemicals arriving from outer space. Triggered maybe by lightning or by ultraviolet light, the organic compounds began to link together and form proteins. The proteins grew and split. Life was launched. The record of prehistoric life is written in rock, fossils. The word means literally dug up. Dig this fossil and you're looking at traces of the oldest living things ever found. Strands of simple algae at least three and a half billion years old. The minute threads left their mark as they died, embedded in layers of mud that turned to rock. It's inside stony cabbages like these, found in a few rare places on the Australian coast, that the evidence is stored. There may be nowhere else on Earth that looks more like the scene of life's first stirrings. When life stops stirring, it may record the moment in a fossil. If mud or sand settles quickly and turns to rock, the recently deceased is stored in the vaults of time. 
fossils are also found deep inside peat, tar, ice, or golden amber, the resin of ancient trees. Some of the tiniest living things were caught in the glowing ooze. As Earth's rocky layers are laid down, pushed up, and crumble away, fossils emerge. They are the only direct evidence of prehistoric life. Of all the life forms ever to exist, 99% are now extinct. Only a very few of them left a trace. From the first primitive living things to more complex organisms, another billion years passed. Now there is enough oxygen around for life to get organized into multi-celled beings. DNA provided endless possibilities, and life took an ever-increasing variety of forms. But only after another billion years or more does the evidence show a gathering storm of life. From a more recent layer come more than a dozen different kinds of jellyfish, looking like flowers flattened in their two-dimensional graves. There were worms and sea pens and other strange animals writing their history on the ocean floor. This was the age of the soft bodies. More than five-sixths of the way through Earth's history, the rocky record begins to fill with the marks of ever stranger creatures. From its fossil, it seemed this odd animal, Hallucigenia, had seven pairs of stilt-like legs and seven tentacles with which to feed. Or was that getting it upside down? A few years later, scientists realized the seven stilts were actually a spiky back, and the seven tentacles were walking legs. Fossils don't come marked this way up. Just 100 million years later came Cathernocystis, with a tail it may have used like a limb to travel backwards across the seabed. It sifted the water for food through a primitive mouth, then expelled it through slits at its other end. This complex new creature shared the seas with the first fish. With no jaws as yet, they swallowed their prey whole. The first bite, as we know it, was still a long way off, but not the first sight. Some of the very first glimpses of the world were seen by these eyes, those of the trilobite. Some were so well preserved that scientists have used the fossilized lenses to take photographs. If only the sights these eyes saw had been preserved as well, the trilobite had an entirely new chassis, segmented and flexible. It could curl up for defense. There were trilobites smaller than a walnut and others bigger than a coconut. Eyes were some of the sophisticated new features that began to evolve. Before another 100 million years had passed, some of the big artillery arrived, combining keen eyesight with the first biting mouths. Imagine a great white shark wearing full body armor, and you've got the leading predator of its day, Dunkleosteus. Long before the more famous jaws, it ate primitive sharks for breakfast. Whether a fossil comes from a watery grave or a dusty dig, it comes up needing a date. Marie Curie is famous for discovering x-rays, but her work with radioactivity also made it possible to assign dates to fossils. Chemical elements within rocks decay, and that can be measured. For instance, the less uranium-238 a rock contains, the older it is. Whatever its age, assembling a fossil is like building a model. 
but with no instructions and definitely no picture on the box. And most likely, there are pieces missing. Just before the age of fishes, some early pioneers had made landfall. But these colonizers weren't animals, they were plants. Small and without leaves or flowers, they did have the first roots. At first, plants were alone on land, unthreatened by animals. It couldn't last. Soon came the pitter-patter of little feet, arthropods, the forerunners of millions of small, creeping insects and crustaceans. Meanwhile, the continents we know today barely existed. Several were massed together in one expanse, later named Gondwanaland. Europe, Greenland, and North America remained separate. All were drifting like crusts of bread on a thick, rocky stew. The dry land was claimed next by swimmers from a watery world. How? This fossil holds the answer. Some fish developed lungs, enabling them to emerge from shallow water and breathe. And bony fins began to support their weight on land. A fossilized coelacanth reveals the kinds of bones which took the first ever steps. Such bones were to become feet. The first amphibians had landed. The ocean-dwelling coelacanth was presumed extinct until 1938 when one made a startling appearance off the coast of South Africa. Fourteen years went by before another was found but more coelacanths have since been discovered alive near Madagascar. They are living fossils from a time before the dinosaurs. If one such ghost still swims the sea today, why not other bizarre relics? Since pre-biblical times, sailors have told of huge monsters and sea serpents. With water covering two-thirds of the earth, it's easy to imagine other strange survivors swimming the depths like the coelacan. There are persistent claims that Loch Ness in Scotland holds a creature unlike any other. A fossil that's certainly dead and buried is coal, one of the fossil fuels. It now supports life with its heat and light. Coal formed when rotting plants turned to peat and were further compressed over millions of years. As seams of coal that would one day fire the Industrial Revolution first formed, along came a sturdy new creature. Making its debut during the age of coal, the cockroach. It can withstand extreme heat and cold, drought and famine. No wonder it has hardly changed across time. Segmented bodies were a hit, and this was just one of the insects to scurry through the leaf litter. Today's cockroaches scavenge for anything from toenails to toothpaste. Could their well-known partiality for small, dark crevices have led to the use of cockroaches as a remedy for earache? Ground cockroach entrails mixed with oil were used as recently as the 16th century to treat an aching ear. The ancient cockroach had some truly fantastic neighbors. Gigantoscorpio, 10 times the size of a modern day scorpion with a stinger the size of a kitchen knife. The even larger Arthropleura took locomotion to new lengths, like a centipede crossed with a stretch limo. There were dragonflies seven times the size of the modern emperor dragonfly. And the first reptiles evolved from amphibians. They were adapted to life on land, laying eggs with a tough skin that didn't dry out in air, a major new development. Fossils lay buried for millions of years before they were first glimpsed by some latecomers in the evolutionary story. Fossil collectors. Among the first to profit from the finds was a 19th century British girl, Mary Anning. 
When just 11 years old, Mary found an ichthyosaur in sands near her home. She sold it for 23 pounds, the price of a small house at the time. Just 280 million years ago, the continents were still mostly bunched together in one gigantic landmass, Pangaea, all Earth. Plants and animals could spread from one continent to another, wandering or drifting with ease. Since then, the continents have drifted thousands of miles apart, so almost identical fossils have been found as far apart as South America and Australia. A vast number of animals have walked the Earth. Estimates run as high as three billion different species. None has so mesmerized the human mind as the largest of them all. Tyrannosaurus rex, mascot of the age of the dinosaurs. But even T-Rex was topped by flying reptiles like the giant pterosaur. In the Nevada desert, a reconstructed pterosaur took flight with a computer for a brain. Even at half scale, its wingspan matched that of a modern glider. The last time such a shadow was cast on these rocks, dinosaurs roamed the earth. At the same time, the cockroach was well on its way to becoming one of the most tenacious creatures on earth. Now it had a new scheme. Instead of laying single eggs, it produced egg cases that held 40 to 50 eggs. Cockroaches that foraged successfully by night were favored to survive. Sensitive antennae could detect the slightest disturbance and trigger tiny legs to take off. 65 million years ago, cockroaches must have run for cover when something wiped out the dinosaurs, possibly a massive meteorite, climatic change, or even cancer caused by radiation from a collapsing star. The age of the dinosaurs had come to an end, yet this was not the largest extinction ever. That happened before the dinosaurs existed when 95% of all living species suddenly vanished from the fossil record. It's possible that Pangaea's own geography contributed to the deaths. One single landmass, half frozen, half desert, was ill-equipped to absorb the impact of a massive change. Surviving both these extinctions was, yes, the cockroach, which no doubt feasted on the remains of the dead. But none benefited from the dinosaur's demise quite as much as some new creatures waiting in the wings, mammals. Unlike the reptiles, mammals were warm-blooded. They could hunt at night, and they developed special tools to carry with them on the hunt. Daggers and blades, slicers and choppers, for some, permanent meshing teeth. And unlike reptiles whose eggs are vulnerable to attack, the mammals had a new reproductive system. Their young developed internally and newborns were fed on milk. The complex design worked for mammals on the wing, beneath the waves, and underground. And arms and legs could carry mammals across the continents, all evolved from animals that lived when the dinosaurs walked the earth. There were other survivors from before the dinosaurs. The magnolia, one of the most ancient flowers on earth. The crocodile, though it has changed a bit. Some crocodiles once grew to the length of two tanks put end to end. Maybe it's not so surprising that early images of dragons are virtually identical to crocodiles with wings. Birds too survived. From out of the reptiles they had flown with the feathers evolved from scales. By the middle of the 19th century, scientists were racing to come up with an explanation for it all. 
Why and how had such a variety of living things come into being? Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection was based on his observations of the natural world. By 1859, he concluded that it is the animals best suited to survive that are most likely to pass their characteristics on to the next generation. Tortoises were one tip-off. In the Galapagos Islands, those that needed to reach high into the brush for food could. Their necks and shells, different from those tortoises on the other islands, seem to have evolved for that purpose. Darwin's new theory could explain even this, a three-toed foot on a horse-like animal. As the strongest toe continued to evolve, it became the single hoof seen today with fantastic running ability over hard ground. As a period much closer to our time thundered along, familiar forms took shape, but with unfamiliar twists. The ground sloth didn't live in trees like its descendants, since few trees could support its weight. Giant elk bore equally giant antlers. The elephant bird laid eggs that were almost 200 times larger than a hen's egg today. Some animals grew to immense sizes just because they could. There was an abundance of food and little competition. Other animals, however, started small. The earliest horses were only the size of a dog. Millions of years after the dinosaurs, weird and wonderful creatures still walk the earth. Or found other means of travel with features that were scrambled in surprising combinations. The South American mixed up mammal had an elephant's trunk, a camel's body, and the feet of a rhinoceros. By 50 million years ago, the continents were nearly as they are today, but still traveling. India crashed into Asia, creating the Himalayas, which are still rising today. Antarctica headed south into its deep freeze. The stage was set for the emergence of a mammal that would find entirely new ways to occupy every corner of the planet. It would evolve from a creature with links to both past and present, whose remains were first discovered in 1974. The spectacular find was named Lucy, after the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy was related to both apes and humans. Though an adult, she stood just slightly taller than an average six-year-old child, but she stood. She was among the first primates to walk upright. Others of Lucy's kind left these footprints probably two adults with a child, they walked the earth at least 3.7 million years ago. Although Darwin's theory had unleashed a storm of debate that continues today, there is little disagreement among scientists. About three million years after Lucy, one animal evolved into a familiar looking hunter with a remarkable brain, Homo sapiens from the Latin meaning wise person. Modern humanity's debut came just a heartbeat ago by Earth's time. But it was not a smooth ride. There were at least seven variations on the human theme, including the Neanderthals, whose remains were first found at the Neander Valley in Germany. Neanderthals stood six feet tall with bones immense for their height. They have been portrayed as dumb, unfeeling, 
But scientists had misinterpreted their find, a skull ravaged by disease. Evidence indicates the Neanderthals buried flowers with their dead. Another human species was to outhunt the Neanderthals and drive them to extinction. This new omnivore had a feature that would serve it well, the ability to learn and invent in remarkable new ways. Homo sapiens, modern man, has come a long way, yet only in the latest blink on Earth's time scale. And finally, we have come to scratch the surface of our planet's past, a past that makes our own history seem tiny by comparison. And still, new discoveries come to the surface. In 1995, the symbian Pandora, a minuscule creature, was found right under our noses, or rather, the lobster's nose where it lives. It is the first known member of an entirely new group of living things. We can only wonder what other creatures may have come and gone without leaving a trace. Whatever our future holds, it's likely that life in some form will carry on, tenacious and resilient as the cockroach. And could another life story be in the making? In the universe of solar systems, it seems more than possible. In 1996, two distant planets were found to have conditions that might support life temperatures not unlike the Earth so long ago, and the potential for rain and oceans. Their prehistoric life could just possibly be getting started now. Witness Museum, created by combining traditional filmmaking techniques with state-of-the-art graphics. Stripping away the mysteries of nature and science to reveal the essence of each subject. Bringing the world into sharp focus. The making of Eyewitness. The distinct style of the eyewitness books is the basis for each of the programs. Each half-hour episode is based on a book title. The eyewitness book's visual style gives the program makers a starting point and a challenge. The challenge of transferring clarity and super-realism into moving images and sound. Now let's take a look behind the scenes at the making of prehistoric life. The eyewitness team has filmed some fairly extraordinary things, but they were really stretched when it came to prehistoric life. Filming the cosmos as it was four billion years ago. The model makers built the moon. After using untold buckets of white paint to create the eyewitness style, the crew now had to plunge the studio into blackness. Light-absorbing velvet drapes were suspended from the walls and the studio lights were dimmed in shrouds. The moon and planets were 3D models. Standing in for the sun, a spotlight completed the effect. A total eclipse of the moon. 
prehistoric life repeatedly challenged the team to film the unfilmable. How do you capture a hundred million years of continental drift in a single shot? Move it, move it. The solution called for large model continents on wheels lit from below. Some final touches. A fisheye lens puts the scene into a curved, globe-like perspective. When dry ice hits water, fog is made and the scene gets a little atmosphere. The camera flies overhead, sweeping from continent to continent, creating a memorable image of the world as it once was. Here's another challenge. Did anyone order soup? Primordial soup. The earth before the formation of continents. The stock is 100% wallpaper paste, dyed yellow and red. To make it churn, the crew laid in a network of pipes and bubbled a mixture of gas and air through the soup. Lumps of dry ice suggest a sulfurous steam. Jets of the stuff to make for more eerie effects. And once the gas is lit, the newly formed Earth is ready for flyover filming. Aerial shots of a subject which precedes the aeroplane and photography by four billion years.